Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 19 through 22, and then we're going to jump over to chapter 5 and read verses 21 through 33. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And that applies to every single believer in Christ. And it doesn't matter what your marital status is. Because when Paul is writing this letter, as the Lord is giving it to them, it applies if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Christ is your foundation. Now, chapter 5, Paul speaking in particular to both wives and husbands. Chapter 5, verse 21. Here comes the very last verse that he's still speaking in general, to everyone in the church, everyone who professes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He's coming to an end of a section, and he uses this language. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is to be a submission among the brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's mutual. It's for every one of us. And now specifically, in particular, verse 22 How does that submission look when it comes to marriage? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. That is in the context of this letter and in Scripture in general. That is to everything that has to do with what it means to live for Jesus. Crystal doesn't have to follow. My wife Cheryl does not have to follow me into sin. That's not what everything means. What does submission for a husband look like? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he, Jesus Christ, watch the, it's weaving in and out between a husband's role, taking his cue from Christ, so that, verse 27, he, Jesus Christ, might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Back to now the husbands. In the same way, Husbands taking their cue from watching Christ. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Quoting Genesis chapter 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In other words, one plus one equals one. This, this one plus one equals one is a mystery. And it's a profound one. This mystery is profound. Why? Because for a long time it was just strange to get married. You knew you were supposed to, but you didn't know why. It's been a mystery. And then all of a sudden Jesus shows up. Oh, that's why we've been doing this. Uh Uh-huh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it, a man and a woman, still equals one in marriage, that it, that, refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as, as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Evolution cannot explain why a man and a woman would get married. Mate, yes, but not get married. 
If Charles Darwin was right, no man would voluntarily submit himself to live with one woman and provide for her, serve her, take his shoes off when he enters the house anyway, love her alone, and stick around to care for the kids. He just wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't like taking my shoes off. I like wearing them anywhere I want to. Mud everywhere. If Charles Darwin was right, no woman would voluntarily submit herself to live with one man who still can't find the laundry basket. And put the, shoe, put the dishes in the dishwasher, not in the sink. Left to ourselves, mankind would never have invented marriage. He wouldn't have. But being made in the image of God, we instinctively know that marriage, that making a covenant to love one another and no one else till death parts us is not, it is not a cultural tradition. It's grounded in the historic death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which was planned before the world began. God the Father created human marriage to display Christ and the church. Whether or not mankind realizes that he is actually participating in something that is divine and sacred. Such as God's common grace and mercy to mankind. The mystery is that human marriage is a living drama of Christ and his bride, the church. We learn from Christ and the church what are the roles of husbands and wives. Paul's point here in this letter to the Ephesian church is that the roles between husband and wife are not arbitrarily assigned. And they are not reversible without obscuring God's purpose for marriage. The roles of husband and wife are rooted in the distinctive roles of Christ and his church. In other words, God means to say something to the world about his son and his church by the way husbands and wives relate to each other. Which means this wedding today is not founded on a perfect past or even the hopes of compatibility. When I do premarital counseling, I love exposing the, the false view, oh, we're compatible. Pfft. Yeah, right. And I just set that up. I mean, they swing at that curveball every single time. And the next week, I show them how they're not compatible. I've had people just crying, sitting right in front of me, angry as can be at each other. And I just, I just let, let it go. See, you're not. You're both selfish. You're just doing a good job right now in front of me and in front of each other covering it up. You have no idea how selfish he is. And I say to the fiance, you have no idea. He's got more than enough to bust this marriage wide open without your help. And then I looked to her and I looked then I looked at him. I said, she's got enough selfishness in her life that she has the ability to blow this marriage wide open without your help. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that Christ came that we may no longer live for ourselves but for him who died and rose again. Changes everything. Now I know they have a lot in common. They like doing some things together but that's not the ground. That's not the foundation of marriage. Just because you like to go hiking together that's not going to keep your marriage together. It just won't. It better be a whole lot more than that. And the safest ground to build a marriage on is Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the foundation of marriage. Here in verse 21 of chapter 5, when just before Paul goes particular to husbands and wives, he's saying his last thing in general to the church, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it's a mutual submission here. 
But that mutual submission in verse 21 does not rule out a husband's special responsibility to lead and a wife's special responsibility to support that leadership with her gifts and talents. Christ submitted himself to the church in one way with a servant leadership that cost him his life. And the church submits herself to Christ in another way by honoring his leadership and following him. So, mutual submission does not rule out distinction. I submit to Cheryl and she submits to me. Verse 21. That's what we do because we're both we both belong to the Lord and we belong to the Lord before we belong to each other. Ephesians chapter 1. Now that we've come to know each other, but we know each other as we're disciples of Jesus Christ first. Now that we are husband and wife, now this submitting begins to take on a dance. I submit to lead her with Christ-like leadership, and she submits to follow me with church-like submission. And the foundation for such a union is based upon what Christ did for sinners who have been forgiven of their sins. I've enjoyed uh, my time with uh, Thomas and Crystal. Um, Thomas is a, is, a, is a piece of work. Crystal, this is your last opportunity to back out. We've talked a lot about marriage and, and even the things that have to do with just what it means to just live our lives for the Lord. Uh, a lot of things, and, and I've had the great privilege uh, of being a part of their lives, and just, uh, just thank, I'm very thankful to the Lord. In a wedding ceremony, I, I, I in particular, talk to the, the couple that's going to be married. And even though this is a morning worship service, I still want to direct my attention to Thomas and Crystal for a few moments. And I'm just going to go back and forth, kind of like this letter, Ephesians. I'm going to talk to all of us, all of us in here. But I've got a few things to say to Thomas and Crystal that I want to add on uh, in addition to what we have been talking about for quite some time. And I intentionally did not give you a sermon outline, as I always do, nearly always. And the reason why is because I don't want you writing right now. I just want you listening. I'll post this script online, leaving out the Thomas and the Crystal part. I'll, I'll make it general. I have two things to say to you both. <laughs> Number one, I want you to know yourself and know your spouse as one that Christ died for. So here's what I mean. Thomas, I need you to know yourself as a, as a person that Christ died for. Crystal, I need you to do the same. That you know yourself as a person that Christ died for. But not only that, that's not where it stops. Uh, Crystal, I need you to look at Thomas and know that Christ died for him. And Thomas, I need you to look at Crystal and know that Christ died for her. So it's not only for yourself, but it's for the other as well. Here in this Ephesian letter, long before the Apostle Paul addressed husbands and wives in particular, he addressed you in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. As one who was chosen for salvation before the world even began, blessed you with every spiritual blessing that you would be holy and blameless in Christ, predestined you for adoption, redeemed you in Christ before you were even born, made you alive in Christ, gave his spirit to you, a guarantee for your future inheritance, and saved you by his grace. That's what he did for you. Isn't that amazing? And it's got nothing to do with Thomas, and it's got nothing to do with Crystal. And this is why it's so important to keep this in mind. If your identity is grounded in anything else, you will struggle to not only be honest with your sins, but you will struggle to love one another when you have failed. Feeling that you're unworthy to love and be loved. 
Let me repeat that. Feeling that you're unworthy to love and be loved. It's hard to move forward to one another when you have failed each other. Truth is, you already are unworthy to love and be loved. Luke 17, the unworthy servant. You see, knowing who you are in Christ frees you from fearing rejection and frees you from having to be the savior of your marriage. Thomas, you don't have to save her. She's already got a savior. And he died and was buried and rose again. Crystal, he's a piece of work, but you don't have to save him. He's already got a savior. Christ is the savior of your marriage. Christ. Headship then takes the lead in reconciliation. That's what headship means here. It means it's several things, but here in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Headship means taking the lead in reconciliation. That's the difference between the general submission of verse 21 and the particular submission that is being explained here between wives and husbands. This does not mean that wives should never say they are sorry. But in the relationship between Christ and his church, let me ask the congregation, who took the initiative to make all things new? Who left the comfort and security of his throne to come to Calvary? Who came back to the Apostle Peter after three denials? And who has returned to you again and again and again? Great is his faithfulness. It is new every morning. Husbands, your leadership means take the lead. It doesn't matter if it's her fault. That was a hard thing to learn. It was Cheryl's fault. I'm not... I'm, I'll just, I'm taking a long walk. Let me know when you want me. And, and then put the burden on her to move forward, to move close, to say, can we talk? At times, Cheryl did that. In fact, many times. Because I, I don't want to talk. You know why I don't want to talk? Starts with a P. Pride. It's pride. It's just pride. It took me a while to learn that this is my responsibility. It's what it means to be head. It means to take the initiative in reconciliation. And it doesn't matter what I think, who's to blame and who's more at fault. It doesn't matter. Just like it didn't matter to Jesus, right? Okay. Didn't matter to Jesus. So who's going to break the cold silence? You. I don't know how you do it. Sometimes I still don't know how. But that's what God has called you to do, Thomas. Let me say a bit more about this. Many times we won't try as husbands. We won't even try unless we have a foolproof plan you know why? Because we don't like to fail. How many of us men love to get up every morning and say, man, I just hope I fail about 10 times today. I don't like failing. I hate it. I don't like looking inept. I don't like looking weak. I don't like looking like I don't know what I'm doing. You know why? Starts with a P. There you go. Too often this pride prevents us from starting over again. 
to the wives, because you also know yourself as one that Christ died for. When your husband fails, permit your husband to start all over again. I mean, that's what you really want, don't you? You want your husband to start all over again, to try again. You know that. If a husband's particular sins are indifference, apathy, and controlling anger, like mine, a wife's sin is shaming her husband when he fails. And she doesn't even have to speak a word. A little rolling of the eyes. But when a wife graciously submits to her husband's role of leading and serving, serving even though he failed, she is saying, in effect, I want you to lead me. Please don't stop trying. And I love how Cheryl and I have learned this dance over the years. No one wants me to try harder again, even though I failed, than Cheryl does. And I know that. Try again. Get up and try again. I want you to lead me. And you know what? When a wife does that, he will try again. Even at the risk of failure. Even at the risk of failing. Because that's a consequence of trying. You might fail again. And if this is what was done to Jesus, whoops, turned the wrong page. So, Thomas and Crystal, know yourself and know your spouse as one that Christ died for. And the second thing, and the last thing that I want to say is this. Believe that you have been blessed in Christ for this marriage. So I want you to know each other and yourself that Christ died for me. Christ died for her. Christ died for him. Secondly, believe that you have been blessed in Christ for this marriage. Would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Ephesians 1, verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Don't you see? You see, chapter 1, verse 3 comes before chapter 5, verse 22 and onward. Because without this foundation in Christ, then I don't have the ability to do chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. I don't have the ability to, to handle these verbs that are coming. To be gentle and kind. Not using slanderous words to one another. I've been blessed in the heavenly places. It's secure. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's the ultimate. He's done this so that ultimately we would enjoy praising Enjoy extolling how incredible, loving, and kind God is because of His grace. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption. Christ died on the cross for our sins through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him. Everything. Everything. Things in heaven and things on earth. All good things, all bad things. 
Hold on. I'm going to say something about that. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, bad things, good things, who works all things according, not to my counsel, not to yours, but to the counsel of his will. Why? So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be, again, the third time, second time, I mean, to the praise of his glory, enjoying God because he is so good, so generous to unworthy sinners. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Third time now, to the praise of his glory. Glory meaning beauty, his character. When you see something really beautiful, when you listen to something a beautiful piece of music, you say, nah, that was a great piece of music. When you taste a good food, you say, wow, that was a great restaurant. I'm going back again. You are praising the beauty, the glory of music, food, a great ball game, a great sunset. Paul says that here, he will unite all things in him, works all things according to the counsel of his will. Thomas and Crystal, every broken promise that broke your heart and every dismissive resignation that left you empty will not slip away from the ultimate goal to the praise of the glory of His grace. How do you know, Ivan? This is how I know. Because we just read it. This redemption in Christ. Ivan, what are you, what are you getting at? Here it is. All the lies and all the deception and the murder of Jesus Christ is to the praise of the glory of His grace. Yeah. And if what was done to Jesus is the means by which God the Father will fill the universe with joy, then you can count on it. Your sins and the sins that have been committed against you will not cancel out the Lord's plan to give you joy in the beauty and display of God's grace in your lives. Nothing out cancels God's grace. It's more powerful than sin. We've been learning this in Romans. Thomas and Crystal, you don't deserve the joy that you're about to enter. And that's the point. You don't deserve this joy. That's the point. That's why God gets all the glory and we get all the joy. God is merciful and abounding in steadfast love. If he gave his son, how will he not also freely give you all things for your enjoyment of him? Not only in this life, but especially in the one to come. That's how wonderful the gospel is. And that's the foundation of every marriage, at least that it ought to be. It ought to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these great truths that explains so much that answers many questions about this life. We don't pretend to have all the answers, and the Bible is not an answer book for every single question. The Apostle John said at the end of his gospel that this world is not even not big enough to hold enough of the books that would be, could be written about Jesus Christ alone. But we do have enough we have the historical fact that a man named Jesus claimed to be God 
He said things that only God can say. He did things that only God could do. And he proved it with his life. And he proved it with his death, burial, and resurrection. And we thank you for that. All of world history revolves around the fact that this man is, was, is who he said he was or he was the best liar that the world has ever seen. And I'm not about willing to bet my eternal soul that he was lying. He was telling the truth. And I thank you so much for that. So Lord, as we continue to worship you, we ask your blessings now. As is your word, not man. Man didn't invent this. You did. As you unite Thomas and Crystal. So that one plus one equals one. In your name we pray. Amen.